Tonight marks exactly 16 months since we've been able to have a full event in the store. It was March 8th of 2020. <laughs> um, we're so grateful for the continued support of customers like yourselves, authors like Jane, and the uh, whole community for keeping Roundabout in your uh, thoughts during this time and to keep us going. Uh, before we get to tonight's event, I did want to remind everyone of some of the other amazing events we have coming up in person and online. So in two weeks, we are joining Kirsten Hanna and Christina Baker Klein for a special virtual book club for the Four Winds. Uh, we highly encourage you to purchase a book so you can read it before the event. And then in three weeks, we're so excited to join uh, RJ Palacio, author of Wonder, and Josh Radner for a special conversation for Pony, Palacio's new book. So please check our website and Facebook page for all the details. Uh, and now on to the main event. If you did uh, reserve a book, we will have it for you at the register after this event. Uh, if you're joining us via Zoom, we will also have that for you. Give us a call and tell us how you want to pick it up. Um, I have a feeling most of you know this author's illustrious background, but I'm gonna remind you one more time. So Jane Kirkpatrick is the New York Times and CBA bestselling and award-winning author of 40 books, including Something Worth Doing, One More River to Cross, Everything She Didn't Say, uh, and A Sweetness to the Soul, which won the prestigious Wrangler Award from the Western Heritage Sun Center. Her works have won the Willa Literary Award, the Carroll Award for Historical Fiction, and the 2016 Will Rogers Gold Medallion Award. Jane divides her time between Central Oregon and California with her husband, Jerry, and Cavalier King Charles Samuel Caesar. So please give a warm round to Jane Kirkpatrick. Yeah, you have to kind of speak. I can move it up a little too. Julie, do you want to extend that for her? <laughs> There you go. Oh, I'm just really glad to come to my Jerry and she sends his regards. So I think I'm here. I just think that I'm going to get a hundred times like for so long. He's just my best father. He's given us all the jokes. He's heard all the stories. And so, um, so tonight I wanted to talk with you, tell you some stories, basically, because that's what I do. But that's what you all do too, because stories are the most powerful way we have an organizing experience. D. H. Lawrence said, "The stories tell us who we are and who we will become." And when William Faulkner accepted the Pulitzer Prize in 1954, he said the only stories with the writer's blood, and sweat, and tears were stories of the human heart and conflict with itself. Willa Cather, who also won the Pulitzer, she said the stories that engage us as, um, as adults are based on experiences that we had before we turned 15, which I find really intriguing because that's such a volatile time of our life, that adolescence. But it's also why I think um, people who write, writers who write for children and young adults, I think are some of the best writers working today because they, uh, kids won't let you take 300 pages like I take to get to the point. You know, they want stories that are just basically bypass and go directly. And, and people have said to me that, you know, their life is in chaos or whatever, and they used to love to read, but they've gotten away from it. And what could I recommend? And I tell them to come to these stores and to look for the Caldecott winners and the Newberry winners and buy those books um, because those are the ones that are going to reach us and reach the power of story. Uh, Native American people, in my experience in Warm Springs, uh, one of the elders told me that before they would go into a healing ceremony, they would ask the person who was ill three questions. And the three questions would tell them how far from health they had fallen, the answers were. 
And the first question was, when was the last time you sang? When was the last time you danced? And when was the last time you told your story? And that's how powerful stories are for us. Well, Cather um, identified two emotions that she thought were really powerful in stories, especially in that adolescence, and they were passion and betrayal. And I actually have come up with a couple of more because I can remember being 15. <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. Um, um, and I think part of what goes on during that time period is acceptance, that we are looking for acceptance to belong, to find something to belong to. Uh, the author of Passages to India, uh, E.L. Forrester, said, give me me in a story and you'll have a reader for it. And I've always loved that because I think that's a lot of the reasons why people read books is to see themselves inside that story. When I worked at Warm Springs, one of the, the hottest compliments of reviews I ever got was that the janitor or custodian of the building that I worked in said that when I had a book come out, he would buy five copies. And he would keep one and he'd give one to his wife. And then he gave the other three to like two nieces, I think, and a nephew. He said, and then we, we set a night. We're all going to get together in the same room. And we read that book at the same time. He said, that's how we find ourselves inside your stories, which I couldn't have had a better review. Um, and the other emotion that I think drives those stories of adolescence is forgiveness. At least that's what I call that we are looking for forgiveness inside stories. And for me, that sort of, um, because I made a lot of mistakes as an adolescent, I did stupid things. And I'm looking for inside the stories to find out how other people did stupid things and how they got out of it, you know, how they made their way through. Because that, particularly for fiction, a lot of fiction is you give a character a desire, something that they want, and then you set them on their way, but you also set up barriers, things that are going to get in their way. And one of the reasons for doing that is that uh, you all wouldn't read a book where everything went well, <laughs> would be boring. Uh, but the other reason is that that's how a character um, character's story is defined. It's how it's carved out. The Greek word for character comes from a word that means to chisel. And so it's what's left after we've been gouged out, after we've had the challenges, after we've had the trials, that really is our character. Um, I think that's why I personally do not like soap operas because those people have a lot of trouble in their life, don't they? But they don't learn anything from their trouble. <laughs> and they spend a lot of time in hospitals, I've noticed. It must be a cheap place to film, I don't know, but you'd think they would get some learning out of that, but nope, they don't seem to get it. So, um, so that's part of what happens in a story is that you, you give them this desire and then you create obstacles. So, what I would like to do tonight is talk to you about um, the story of Natalie Curtis, who was um, a wealthy young woman in New York in the 18th, she was born in 1875. And she, her father was actually a physician who attended uh, President Lincoln was uh, the night he was uh, assassinated and participated in the autopsy. And so they were prominent people. Um, she had an uncle who went to Harvard with Teddy Roosevelt. So they were prominent. And um, she was trained in music hall and spent her whole life. She went to study in Germany and Europe. And, and the night before her New York Philharmonic debut in 1897, she had a, she had a breakdown. And uh, she did not perform for five years after that and was in this malaise until her brother, who had gone to the West, he, he had been a librarian at the New York Library, and he had asthma, and he had gone West. Uh, the two of them were the only two who made a break from this family. There were six children, and uh, in all the senses, it's always they're at home. None of them ever married except uh, Natalie and her brother, George. So he invited her to go West, and the story really uh, takes her into a time of rediscovery, and particularly as she discovers Indian music, Native American music, which at the time was under great suppression as were the other arts. There was uh, a desire to suppress uh, Indian, Indian 
culture and activity to assimilate Native people into the white culture. And there was a code of Indian offenses that laid out what should be the punishment for people singing their song, their corn pounding song or a lullaby, or uh, along with a felony or whatever kinds of things. So the codes listed that um, it was meant to be an, for law enforcement primarily, but it became a, a very cultural and a very um, punishing set of codes that Natalie discovered once she came to the West. So I, I thought I would tell you her story by, um, I call these my alphabet, partly because it helps me to sort of stay on track. Um, and so I want to use the word music. And so I'll tell you some stories about each of the letters in that word, and hopefully that will tell you the story of Natalie without telling you the story so that you don't have to read the book. I mean, <laughs> I don't want to tell you everything. Um, so the first letter, of course, M, you would think that stands for music, but no, it stands for movement. Of course, there are movements in music. There are sections of a composition of an orchestra, which are called a movement. But, and the movements are always moving toward something more, a finished composition. But the other word for movement has to do with our physical movement. And one of the things about music that is so critical is that it is one of the four sensory um, elements that reach the part of our brain, um, the amygdala, that when we are under great stress, when life is challenging us, um, we can we have we have been known to shut down as human beings, and this is particularly true for children who face trauma. And they shut down. Um, there's actually even a disorder called absent epilepsy, um, absent seizure epilepsy, and it is where children are so um, they're so attacked by things going on in their brain, they're unable to focus. And teachers have told me about these kids for years because they say that we only have three days a week to teach them. Because on Friday, they're gearing up for the uncertainty of the weekend. And on Monday, they're recovering from the uncertainty of the weekend without the structure. So Baylor University uh, did some research about what could help children who experience trauma. And it's the same research that tells us as adults. And that's what I think was part of what happened for Natalie and part of her healing. And the, the, what they found is that the kind of counseling that I was trained to do as a, a clinical social worker, as a mental health person, is not nearly as effective as these four things. Um, music, movement, like dance, or gardening, or golfing, or uh, quilting, something that involves the, your hands and your body, uh, art in terms of painting and photography, other kinds of things, and story, whether you wrote that or whether you read it. Um, and that you don't even have to know what it is that this child has experienced, but those four things can make a huge difference. In my last newsletter, I, I wrote a little bit about this as a personal experience, is that I, as a child, I had a very, um, significant trauma. I was very young and I, my parents knew nothing about it and I didn't really understand it. But I'm, it, it, it presented itself as great anxiety, terrible fear. I would have lots of rituals, lots of rigid things. I had to say a certain prayer three times. And if I messed up or if I fell asleep, um, I'd have to like say it again in the morning. Um, and I, I was sleepless a lot, and there were all these kinds of tensions. And for some reason, my dad was a dairy farmer, and my mom was a nurse. They bought a um, record player. So this is the 50s, and they put on the long playing record of Anton Dvorak's The New World Symphony. It's like an hour long, and, and I would go to sleep by that music every night. And the thing that happened was at first, I could sleep and I didn't have the nightmares. And I remember waking up and being happy for the first time in many, many months. And the other symptoms began to go away. And so I, I can't attribute to anything in my life except the music 
And it wasn't until I became into training as a professional therapist that I realized how powerful music was as a healing element. And I think that's what happened for Gabby, um, that the movement that she encountered in music and the activity that she began to engage in, um, going from reservation to reservation, trying to record on her little Edison machine, um, changed her life and began to bring her healing maybe in ways that she didn't even realize until much later. So the U word in music stands for unruly. Um, someone had described a number of these women who made a change. It was a big change. It was the turn of the century, 1902, 1903, that era. You know, the Industrial Revolution was happening. Big changes were happening. And um, women of her status were expected to get married and, um, and stay at home until they were married. And if they did get married, they certainly couldn't go on tour and perform as musicians. And at the very most, if they got married, they could give music lessons, but they wouldn't be able to perform. It was just not, it just not done. And uh, Natalie and there were other women of that period who wanted something different. And so her brother offered her that something different to just take a look at what's going on out in the West. I like to think that the West was, you know, at the, at the cutting edge of doing something different, being a little unruly. And we always sort of think about the West as being un, you know, unmanageable, but there are good things about unruliness because there aren't necessarily the rules. She could, she could try new things. And so she came West with her brother. They actually arrived in 19, uh, 1902, New Year's Eve. And uh, she and her brother were in Pasadena at the friend of Charles Loomis, who was quite a unruly man himself. He was the head that had started the Los Angeles uh, Times. He had walked his way across the country from Ohio to there, wrote poems on birch bark and, and, and built this. It's called El, El Alicel. It's in Pasadena and you can visit it when COVID is over. Um, it's a museum and it's awkward looking building, but he was very unruly too. And he um, was an Indian rights activist and he knew about the code of offenses and he was trying to get things changed. And so Natalie comes into their life and she and George were guests. And, and um, he proposes that they go to the um, old Arobi Hopi village and uh, record surreptitiously and particularly children and go into the schools and see what was happening there, um, what kind of punishments were going on, but also collect the music before it was lost because they were not to be seen at the south. And she and her brother decide to do that um, and take this risk. And before they get there, they go to Yuma, Arizona. I'm not sure why, because there was not much there in 1902. <laughs> Uh, there was a territorial prison which had a massive library, over a thousand pieces of collection. So perhaps because George was writing a book, um, and so maybe they went there for research, I don't know. But while they were there, Natalie heard a young woman singing a song that changed her life. And I just want to read a little piece about that because this is how she became somewhat unruly. And, um, and she encountered another unruly um, indigenous woman. The air had still snow topped distant rounded hills. As she started at the steps to the hotel, she stopped. A song pulled on her like the siren songs calling Ulysses. I must go there. She headed toward the tracks, hoping a little trespassing might not land her in the territorial prison. If she could find the boys singing, it would be worth incarceration. Wouldn't that be a letter to my mother? A gray bird twittered happy tunes as she walked, pulled toward the music. She crossed the tracks, stepping carefully, seeing the brown rushing waters of Colorado below her. The woman's song called to her soul. Natalie stopped, listened, and hurried on, fearful she might not find the singer before the song ended. She approached the cluster of hogans, flat roof, round-sided structures made of weathered wood spread with canvas, some adobe, others formed of discards and whatever seemed to be at hand. There was no drum, no flute. The song light, happy, traveling from double time to three-quarter time, 
back to quarter and onto three eighths. Complex, darting as a bird, dipping and swooping at sound. She made her way toward the singer, ignoring the looks of those who parted for her with a strange intruder. A fuzzy bodied puppy sniffed at her high button boots, leading the rest of the litter to cluster around her, yapping. She kept moving, lifting the pups aside gently with her feet, avoiding the sharp little teeth, captivated by the clarity of voice, the lilt of allure. Something broke inside Abby at that moment. Tears formed in her eyes, and she found a place of peace she had not known for years through the healing wash of the Indian woman's creative song. She had begun her journey home. Um, it, she met a woman named Shiparella, and um, this woman it was just so fortunate because not only was she a wonderful singer, uh, but she uh, knew Spanish and English, and she had traveled to Washington, D.C. as years earlier. So it was just it was serendipitous, so it was divine that the very first person she should encounter that would draw her forward was someone with whom she could communicate. So I always loved that that, that, that was what you know, helped to get her um, story forward and become a different kind of unruly woman. So let's see, what have I got here? And you, yes, okay, yes. Yeah, I don't have a spell check, so if I skip a letter, I'm sure that I don't know. Um, so the S word to me is the seeking word. Uh, C.S. Lewis talks about a German word that he, he said all of us have is just this great longing to find meaning. And I pronounce it as Zengzug. I've never actually heard it pronounced. If you're a German and you know how to pronounce it, I would love that. Um, but it means it's almost a compulsion to find meaning and purpose in your life. And I think part of uh, Nally's malaise was that for five years, she didn't have it. Music was no longer her purpose. And so she was looking for something different, something new. And that search became basically part of the journey of the rest of her life. Um, one of the things that uh, she was struck by is that um, she soon learned, and partly from Charles Loomis, but also her brother, that um, if they got caught, of recording music, they would get kicked off the reservation because you could rent little cottages on the reservations. Um, but if, if they broke the law, they would get kicked off. But the Indian people who sang would be punished. And one of the ways they punished um, was by cutting the rations, which was critical because we had put them all on the reservation in their other economic life. Uh, whether it was crops or whether it was buffalo hunting or in the southwest, it was other, um, it was making leavings and so on that could be sold to trading posts. So they, they could eliminate all of that. They could cut down on their food supply um, if they were caught. They could collect children and take them from their uh, village schools and send them to boarding schools. And that happened often. And even contemporary now, we know things that are going on had gone on in boarding schools. Um, so she uh, decides that what might really have to happen is that she would have to use her influence with Teddy Roosevelt as a family friend who was then the president of the United States uh, to see if she could get permission to do something to make a difference before all of these artistry and music was lost. And she approached him. Teddy Roosevelt was uh, notorious for the you know, the statement that he made at one point where he said the only good Indian was a dead Indian. And so she had an uphill climb to try to get Teddy Roosevelt's ear. Um, she was able to meet with him. She went back to New York, uh, met with him, and she appealed to him through the, through the arts because he was someone who cared about the arts. And she said, you know, America will never have its own culture like the Greek culture or the Roman culture until it takes into account the original cultures that were here. And he thought that. He felt that, well, maybe that was so. And she said, there's no reason to you know, cut children's hair because they've sung a song. And, and, and if they do get assimilated, then who will remember? Who will, how will they know that their ancestor, what their grandmother said? And they weren't supposed to speak their native language either. So he gives her permission. He writes her a letter and says, you can go on to any reservation and you can sing, have anyone in the schools 
singing whatever they would like as long as they are doing that uh, willfully. And no one can be punished. No one will be punished. And that began um, for the next four years. She and George and a wagon uh, began searching for people who would be singing their songs that she could then record. Uh, she was, I think, aware even at a young, at that time period, about the importance of intellectual property, because every single person who recorded, um, who let her record them, whether it was Winnebago people or Dakota people, um, she included their names, she attributed their names, or if they told her a story, she attributed their names. And that's why the book, I'm turned out, that she wrote was is 575 pages. And uh, I, I'll pass this around when I'm, when I'm finished in the sort of the question part so you can see it. Um, but every single artist, every person who told her a story, that person's name is in here. And she even said, she says, um, recorded and edited by Natalie Curtis. She does not claim to be the author of this book. So that began her next journey, her next searching was to be able to pull together this book. Any else? I. Okay, so the I word is one that I, I find just fascinating. Um, and it's a medical term, a uh, very old medical term. And the word is INCAR, I N C A R N. And it translates as the growing of new flesh. And I like that word as part of Natalie's story because of the kind of pain she dealt with the psychic pain, the guilt. I mean, we really don't know why she couldn't perform for five years, whether it was this cultural, social um, distinction that was happening for young women then, or whether it was something else. But somehow, in order to perform again, in order to find the purpose that she was seeking, she had to set aside the pain of that and the woundedness of that and grow new flesh so that she could move forward. And I think that's, um, I, I always think about that in my own life because it's really easy to sort of get stuck in a place sometimes. Oh, maybe I'm on a committee and I think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm never am going to serve on another committee in my life. And because that woman said this or that person said that, I just can't take it. And, um, and I realize that, I, that maybe they hurt my feelings or whatever, but nobody accomplishes anything unless they grow new flesh and you find a new way to say, I would like it if the world was the way I wanted it, but it doesn't always happen that way. And I still feel this compulsion to make a difference. And so I'm gonna to have to go back to that. <laughs> I'm gonna to have to find a way to deal with that woman so that I can move forward. And then the last word is, uh, the last letter is the C word. And I'm always, with Natalie, there are so many possibilities. Um, but I'm going to go with the word compassion because um, it's a word that actually translates as with passion, with intense feeling, with great desire. And one of the stories in the book that I told that actually was a fictionalizing of something that did happen to me on the Wellness Promise Reservation. I worked with families of children who have disabilities. And once a week, there were a, group, a small group of five kids that came in and worked with like speech therapists and occupational therapists and so on. And their parents brought them in to the center. And, um, and it was a, a, a birthday of one of the little girls, Julia. Her dad brought her in. And you know, we had this party and this little children's table and you know, all these white women are standing around. Um, and we decide we're all gonna sing happy birthday which we do, we sing happy birthday. And the, uh, Julia could not tolerate the attention. It was so frightening for her, she slid under the table. And before the adults in the room, I mean, I looked at her dad and he looked back at me and I was like, what are we gonna do? Before we could do anything, all the other kids slid under the table. With her. I thought that was the most wonderful example of compassion that they couldn't fix they didn't even know probably what was going on none of us really knew for sure but they didn't, it didn't matter they knew that what you do when someone's hurting is that you walk beside them you just you just witness to the pain and you sit under the table because that was where she needed them to be 
And and so we serve the cake under the table. <laughs> and they spent the afternoon, they spent that time under the table. And when, when they decided to come out, Julie was smiling and she was happy. Uh, but it was such a lesson to me about how easy it is to think you know what's wrong and want to fix it and how important it is to not do that, but to take a lesson about compassion. I, I like that the, the Hebrew word for um, parable means uh, to toss along the side like a little stone. But And the Greek word for comfort translates as to walk along the side. And so I think that's part of what music can do for us, what story can do for us, what uh, movement can do for us, and certainly what music can do for us. Maya Angelou wrote, uh, she said, when I was a child, uh, music was my refuge. I climbed inside the space between the notes and curled my back to love. And I think Natalie's story, for me at least, uh, helps us look at how we deal with trauma in our life, how we deal with the challenges, but also how compassion, how critical that is for moving forward, for having, uh, for having the, the richness in our life and for uh, dealing with the kinds of challenges that we all, the last 18 months, have really had to deal with. And so uh, it's a story that I hope will resonate, that even though it's set in, you know, 19, it goes from 1902 to 1907, that it has some contemporary connections. And um, that's part of the purpose of fiction is to move people wherever we are. And it, it shares that with music as well. So I hope that you will um, actually pay attention to your own stories and maybe even write some of them down for yourself, but also for your family. Jean Rees, who is an author, uh, was one, once asked why she wrote. And she said, all of life is like a lake made up of many stories fed by many streams. Some of the streams are long and mighty like Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Some of the streams are small like me. The size of the stream doesn't matter. All that matters is the lake. Feed the lake. So I just want to give you the challenge of your Zen Zook to find that purpose and maybe one of those things is to tell your story and to develop. So thank you for coming and uh, thank you for being a part of the renewal of live events at the Roundabout Book. So thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll have to get one of those uh, like automatic applause. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, oh yes, there are plenty of books. <laughs> Enough for you to buy one and also buy one for your friend who you think just really needs this. Yes. <laughs> it helps the color yeah. Yes, wow. yes, excellent. Yes. Yes. So how did I find out about Natalie? So uh, ten years ago, I went to a conference um, of Women Writing the West, which is a really wonderful organization that I've belonged to since its since its origin about 1996. Um, and they encourage not just for women writers, but men and women's writing, but the goal is to encourage stories of women in the American West, Western Mississippi. So children's stories, young adult, fiction, nonfiction, creative nonfiction, uh, poetry. Anyway, I went to their conference um, and it was in Santa Fe. And they took a tour out to the Ghost Ranch in Abiquiu. And some of you are familiar with what the Ghost Ranch is. And one of Natalie's friends, Carol Stanley, um, was one of the principals in the Ghost Ranch. Everybody associates it with Georgia O'Keeffe. But really, um, Carol Stanley, and, and I can't remember exactly the story, whether she won it in a poker game or whether her husband lost it later in a poker game. <laughs> But she managed the ranch there, and now it's um, now it's a Presbyterian uh, conference center, and they do workshops of all kinds. And it's a beautiful the scenery; is just beautiful there. Anyway, um, there was a woman who gave a lecture there on a book that she had written called *Ladies of the Canyon*, 
And it was about these four unruly women, basically wonderfully unruly women, and one of which was Natalie Curtis. And because of her association with the indigenous people, Native Americans, um, and because she was white, um, I, I kept asking the question, which I do in all of my books, how did that happen? How did she manage to get Teddy Roosevelt? How did she manage to write this book? How did she manage that? Um, what, was, what was that about? Um, and the biography that uh, Leslie Colin Kemps, who is the author of that book, uh, is beautifully written. It's just a wonderful book. Um, but it never, that story never let me go. I ordered this book online, the Indians book. Uh, and I'll pass it around if you'd like to sort of heft it. So I ordered it um, 10 years ago, but I just went online today and you can still get copies. Um, this is not the original, of course. The, the, it looks like there's an original online for $575. I did not buy that. <laughs> um, but that was, you know, and I just had it in my office and, and I was working on other stories and had other contracts. And then about three years ago, it it kept raising its little hand saying, don't forget me, don't forget me. Um, and I proposed then that story to, um, to my editor. In some ways, it's an ideal time because there's such an interest in uh, story authenticity and you know ethnicity issues. But it was also a bad time to research and write it because I couldn't get into I couldn't get into libraries. I couldn't get the research part was really somewhat restricted. So I did. I was very grateful that Leslie wrote her book. And then there's another very fat book that's a biography uh, that I highlight in the back. It has, you know, has pictures and so on of Natalie. And it's, it's much more detailed. Because not only did she do Native American music, but she was also asked to go to the ranges uh, the but it's a school, a boarding school in Virginia for um, African Americans, and so she also did uh, a, a book, did books uh, related to African American music to be have it be protected and have it be preserved. And I, uh, one of the things I did in this book is I have what I call intermissions, and they are uh, voices of Native people. They're totally fictional, but I wanted them to have a voice of because the story is told through Natalie's eyes. But I wanted the of the Native experience, for example, Chipperella, the human woman, um, I have her commenting that, you know, it's nice that this white woman, she cares about us, that she's willing to you know, preserve this music and save it, and she's gone to the Washington and, you know, talked to Roosevelt, but wouldn't it be nice if a human person had been able to save it? That could be even better. Um, and so I tried to propose what would um, what other people might have been thinking and it's uh, and I was constantly asking myself well are you appropriating somebody else's story are you being authentic um, by telling someone else's story so there's a there's some tension in the process of um, trying to be faithful to Natalie's story, but also to the people that she and I. Yes. So we have a question from Zoom, and I want to make sure I'm not too loud since I'm right next to the speaker. Um, Karen asked, you've written a, about a lot of women of characters. Which one do you most identify with and why? It's the one I'm working on now. Oh. <laughs> I mean, each woman that I've written about has taught me something about myself I didn't know I needed to know. I always think, oh, this is what I was, this is the reason I wrote this book. Uh, it wasn't just to tell that person's story or to answer the question, what the hell that happen? Um, and, um, and A Sweetness to the Soul, which was the sheer family story, it was probably the most startling for me because I thought I was writing a story about a couple, you know, who had a life with the Waska ones and some Paiute people, and you know, there were those parallels because her name was Jane. Um, her husband was 16 years older than her, and that's how much older Jerry is than me. 
they were trying to build a hotel down the Deschutes River, and we were trying to build a life on the John Day River. And so um, she never had any children, and, and I never had any children either, so there were these parallels. But I, I was trying to tell her story. But when I submitted the manuscript, uh, my editor said, you know, you never really resolved whether she wanted to have children and couldn't have them. Or whether she was kind of ahead of her time and saying, no, I'm not going to have children. There have been some trauma with some siblings in her life. And we said, you know, we're going to resolve that. We're going to go back and you know, take a look at that. And when I went back to take a look at that, I, um, this is more information than we want, but I've had this directly understood. And I thought I had dealt with that, with the, you know, the irrevocability of that. Um, and I was, I understood why that needed to happen. But it really wasn't until I wrote that book that I actually grieved that and understood what Jane might have been going through when she came to the re realization that she was not going to have children. And how could, how then did she bring children into her life? And I have to say that I got some of the most heartfelt letters I have ever had from women, from couples who had been trying to get pregnant, couldn't. Um, and said, you know, what, what we've decided to do is we are going to adopt. And one woman said, I'm going to change my, she was an architect, and she'd been designing businesses, and she said, I am now going to only design elementary schools so that I can be connected to children. Uh, so, I mean, that's pretty powerful for a story. So I, I was pretty amazed. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but I could tell her something about every single one of these women. But you know. <laughs> um, we have one more from Emily. She uh, said, this might be described in more detail in the book, but I am curious to know uh, what the native perspective and response was to Natalie, especially as she re was recording the songs and stories. Was there resistance or hesitation, uh, especially if there were sacred songs recorded? Uh, so Natalie was careful of um, to my knowledge, she did not record the sacred songs. But but interestingly, during that time, um, Indian people were not supposed to perform those symbols like the snake dance. However, the Santa Fe Railroad offered reduced ticket prices if you wanted, as a tourist, to go to Arizona to watch a snake dance. So if, if um, economics came in, well, then maybe the rules could be it's just a little bit. Um, and she was aware of that. And that was one of the things that made her really upset. Uh, what <clears throat> The best thing I can say about how they dealt with her and how they saw her is that um, she, she attributes, I mean, they tell her some pretty amazing stories. And she also records in there about when she brought the book back to them and showed them. Um, what had what she had written about them and so on uh, that there was there was an acceptance of having done that but I think there was also a um, there was a and I have her talk about this that um, she had one of her friends says to her you, you know she dressed she got you know, jewelry and she dressed you know like um, in Indian in many occasions and her friend said her you know, aren't be an Indian and she yeah, I know that, but I feel the safest when I feel the most filled when I'm listening to you. And I think that that genuine care for the Native people and their traditions, I think they accepted that, even though they probably rolled their eyes sometimes. And as any, I think, culture would do it as we make mistakes. You know, I'm sure when I went to Italy and did something stupid that, you know, Restaurant here sort of rolled her eyes with these crazy Americans or whatever. Um, but they also laughed and joked and seemed comfortable and happy that we were spending our life. So, yeah. Yeah. Was she ever accepted into any of the tribes? No, she, um, she was not adopted into any of the tribes. Uh, another woman that I'm writing about, her, and her children was adopted to a tribe, but she was not. Um, and and maybe in part it was, uh, she was very associated with um, Teddy Roosevelt. And there's a, uh, there was a time when after he lost the election, um, 
um, and when he ran as an independent. And he, um, he and his son rode across the reservation and came to the um, Hopi reservation to, to witness some of these dances and ceremonies that were being performed there. And um, she met him there and they had conversations together there. And I, I just I just think that perhaps um, while she was well regarded, I think she was also was very clear. She she was not an Indian, she was white. And um, and then she went on as part of her life is that she gave lectures on Indian music, um, which allowed many people who know nothing about and, and didn't believe that there was a kind of, that there was a, a richness of indigenous um, art and music and culture. She became an educator and used her music as a part of that. She spoke, uh, Roosevelt had her come and uh, have a lunch and she sang for senators and uh, representatives, a large group, um, and talked about why this was important, why it was critical that allowed to perform and to sing and to use their language. And yeah, she she had some influence in that, even though the code of offenses was not was not like it was not basically erased until the 1930s, until the second Roosevelt was in there. I was not able to hear the recordings, um, and I, and that was in part because I, I couldn't get, I couldn't travel, I couldn't even that I was had some emails with some of the people um, with the Denver, the University of Denver, their library, and they were all working at home. So it's just uh, they are, they do exist, some do exist, yeah, but they're pretty they're pretty tinny from what they said, or you know, it was an old it was the the Edis were clunky, you know, and they had all these, you know, these the tubes that had all this stuff that's already cool. And she does talk about, and she recorded in her notes, the songs that she would play for the, for the Indian children and for others, and, and the excitement when she recorded their music and then played it back. And then there were some who did not want her to be involved, and in she went to the Sioux Reservation, it was too close. Um, she felt it was too close to the wounded knee, and they did not want anything to do with her. But by coincidence, she met up with um, a sub chief who was um, Lakota, and um, he, he signed on. He saw the importance of what she was trying to do, and so he was able to make connections so that she could record music there. She also went to the Lewis and Clark um, Exposition in St. Louis in 1904, where there were huge exhibits, many Native American exhibits there, and she recorded Native American there. So she used, you know, she would go to schools and so So that, she ended up uh, getting music from 18 different tribes. So here's a sad story. Do you really like it? <laughs> um, she, uh, so the book came out in 1907. Um, she was able to attend a conference in 1915 when um, uh, Biscone, Biscone, I think I uh, used some of her recorded music and a composition he called Indian Fantasy. And it debuted in um, 1915 in Philadelphia, and she was present there. And uh, a few years later, she met and married Paul Berlin, who is an artist from Santa Fe, and they were married. And in 19, I'm sure, sure it was 1921, I believe, she was giving a lecture at Sorbonne in Paris. And uh, it was a rainy night, and she got off the bus, and a doctor who was hurrying to an emergency did not see her and hit her, and she never regained consciousness. I believe she was 41. So yeah, did not, did not have a long life, but um, but lived you know very productive life. Any of the native languages? Um, I'm not sure. I can't remember whether she did or not. I, I don't think she did. Most of it was English and interpreters. 
So there were, there were lots of Native people who knew English, you know, so they were the tour. Yeah, she had interpreters that traveled with them. George went on. George had worked at a ranch in Polk, Arizona, and he went on to write a book under the uh, under an assumed name. He didn't. He had a pen name, but it, it, I was able to get a copy of that too. And it's really quite quite a nice book. Um, I thought he did a really. I thought it was called "The Wooing of a Recluse." The Wooing of a Recluse is the title. Of the book, so. And it's, and that's all referenced in the author's notes, so you can find it. Some people tell me they read the author's notes first because they're trying to sort out what was fact and what was fiction. I try to do that, but I don't. I try not to tell too much of the story now that I know people read that first. Surprise! I want you to have some surprises. Did she go back to performance? She did sing, for example, for the senators and um, the congressmen. She, um, to my knowledge, she did not play the piano again. She did continue to do some composite, some composing, um, but um, and she sang. Actually, when she went back, the reason she went back initially is because her mother. They had a family friend that he had passed away, and her mother wanted to come and sing at the funeral. And so she came back to sing at the funeral, and that's when she decided she would try to have Teddy Roosevelt. And they had summer homes in a similar area on, on the coast, and that's where she Actually, just an artist rendering of, but it says Southwest so perfectly. Yeah, yeah. I love this color. It's just, it, and she loved, she loved the landscape. She loved the, the people, and and spent the except for coming back to take care of her father when he was ill. She spent the bulk of her life in the Southwest after 1902. So. All right. Well, thank you, and. Uh, thank you. Well, we're going to sign it up. So thank you all. Yep, everybody's waving. <laughs> thank you, everybody, for being here. Don't forget, this will be up on YouTube. All right, I will do that. I think. <laughs>